All right, we're live on another Wednesday. Pretty good day out. I even got the windows open, so it's going to be a little little dynamic lighting in here because the windows are open, and it's making it so you can't see the fireplace very well. But we're not living in the dark today. We're, on, we're coming out of the darkness, out of the winter, and into the summer. We're skipping everything else. All right. Waiting for the questions to roll in. Hopefully you saved up some good ones. If you're listening after the fact, well, ask a question on the Facebook group and maybe I'll see it there. <clears throat> All right, here we go. So I got my first fish rack. Any tips that I wish I knew before I was setting up my own? Yes, uh, 500 videos worth. Every time we do anything, we get a little better. In fact, we're... We've been working at the retail store, setting up a rack of 45 tanks with like, they're basically like 40 breeders kind of on their end, slightly different dimensions, but you can envision that. And uh, every time we do it, <clears throat> usually there's some tweaks and some things like, let's try this. And so um, with this one, mostly it's spending a lot of time with, I'm going to call it cable management. Now, obviously, there's not very many cables, but uh, we have airline, we have water changing lines, and then um, we also have a drain, and then we also have cord management for light. And so what we did this time that is different than other builds that I've done is that on the back, so you got the verticals on your, your rack, right, or your tank stand or whatever. Uh, on the backs of it, we actually use conduit clips um, and actually pieces of PVC, black PVC, that we, we custom made these like two inch pieces of PVC and then <clears throat> put a screw through it. That allowed us to run all of our air and water from the top and we can run it down and each level it runs down and out to the tank, down and out to the tank. And so all of the vertical <clears throat> uh, lines are now hidden away kind of behind the two by four. And then uh, this this weekend, we'll probably install uh, these little cable management clips that you would normally use for any kind of cable management to actually guide them directly to where they need to go in the rack. And so are there tips? Yes, but without knowing the size and the scope and your capability and things like that, there's... But yes, my career has basically been, I actually started YouTube because I wanted to document how to build a fish room because there was a couple of like forum posts and maybe like a half of a website that showed anything when I was in your exact position going, I want to do this. How do I do it? How do I not make the mistakes? And I couldn't find that information easily. You can tap into, you know, our, I don't know, is our advice center have how to build a fish room up there yet? Let me see. I know that will be a category if it's not there yet. Um, let me see. We're going to how to set up a fish tank. Not yet, but we will. So we want to document. Maybe I'll do that this weekend. Um, I've done a video series on how to do drains, fill lines, build different types of racks, things like that. And, uh, you know, so getting that information easily digestible. And from there, you can take it anywhere you want to go. And uh, I, I would say some of it is find some videos on the channel and look by, like, year. Because there was definitely very first fish rooms um, that were, like, inside my house. Then there was fish rooms that were now they're a dedicated room. And there's the store. And there's more dedicated fish rooms. And each time... They've changed. And so you can see like in my current fish room that was a bunch of ponds and, um, you know, that was a different thing than a rack, but I actually didn't install any racks at the beginning. We just did a nice little table. And the reason I did that is because I really enjoy having kind of the right table height aquarium and not so much the ones down below or the ones super high. And so I think there's something to be said for that of just focusing on 12 aquarium, 1240 breeders that's already more than enough for any one human. And so being a person that's been up in the 60s and 70s for tanks and ponds, and a guy that's only had one aquarium, 
I, I think my actual sweet spot is probably around four or five. So, but that would be for personal enjoyment. For work, I need more than that because I have to be testing products. I have to uh, create scenarios. Maybe it's a fish breeding thing for a video. Maybe it's a product I need to test and I actually need blue green algae or I need green water or I need planaria. Those are all things that I have to cultivate or maybe I have to have a tank with Camelanus redworm to test a, a product there. And so that still makes it so I have X amount of tanks I can kind of enjoy, if you will. All right. <clears throat> I love these filterless tanks with their own bio food chain. Here's, here's my hot take on that. Those are amazing and totally impractical for 112% of humans. So what I mean by that is... I've always been an advocate of nature will find a way. I knew I had an old boss that had a frontosa that lived in like a 39 gallon tank that hadn't been fed in two years, right? And the frontosa never got bigger than this, which that's a fish that at two years should probably be like this. So anything can be done. And I do encourage uh, building an ecosystem, but you can go too far. And in my opinion, it is too far when you no longer include aeration uh, you're no longer feeding an aquarium. You're no longer water changing an aquarium. Be, and it's, it's not that any one of those things are bad. It's that all of those in, in combination or accumulation really leads to a, a lazy aquarist. So a very plugged in aquarist that uh, is really taking care of an aquarium and running those techniques, it'll work fine. But a lot of people are seeking, how can I do more tanks with less effort? And that leads to just worse care for fish. And so I guess my takeaway would be, if you can spend five hours with your aquarium every week, you're probably going to be fine, right? I like to feed my fish. I like to clean filters. I like there to be air. I like the circulation of the water. There's a lot of things I like. Uh, and I need to fill my five hours somehow anyway. Uh, but I personally, and, and maybe this is just, you know, my challenge to myself, I don't fall in love with very many tanks that are uh, that natural. There's some very good jar jarrariums and things like that where people will spend a lot of time. If someone's spending a lot of time on something, usually I'll be impressed. But when I see just, uh, you know, look at this, it's in a window, it's doing the Wallstad method. And if it's just their experiment over in the corner, I go, yeah, yeah, it's an experiment over there. But when, I, when I'm when i looking towards, you know, for me personally, breeding a fish, getting good plant growth, enjoying a tank, um, I don't go with those methods. Now, that being said, I love scuds. I love Daphne. I love seed shrimp. I love, I even like planaria. I like all of these things. But what I don't like what has happened on YouTube, it's become a uh, like a faction thing where you're either on this team or on that team. And I honestly think the best of both worlds is taking what you like from each and mixing it. So if you like grabbing some, some mulm and mud from the lake and bringing all that biodiversity to your aquarium, awesome. I still think it will appreciate being aerated. Right. Uh, and so take from what you like from everything and mix it together to make your own method. And that's what I think went on, I would say, before the era of the Internet. You would run into people and your 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 Internet was in your local store and you were just crazy Bob or crazy Joe or crazy Diane over there. The desert tanks X, Y, Z and gets this crazy result that everyone maybe is impressed with now. With the internet, there's a culture of everybody's competing, my way's better, this gets a better result, it depends what you're trying to do, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of what we've lost is, uh, but are you enjoying it? That really, you know, how fast should the fish grow? How much should it sell for? Like, there's a lot of questions that get asked about aquarium hobby all the time. And rarely do I see people going, am I enjoying this hobby? Are you enjoying this hobby? Which that's actually the most important question. Are you enjoying what you're doing? If you're not, that's that's a, you know, for, for a leisure hobby, right? When most of us is a leisure hobby, 
the number one thing should be like, yes, I'm having a ton of fun. And so it can be very fun. I've done wall stat methods. I've done plenums. I've done no filter tanks. I've done no air tanks. I've done, I've tried a bunch of things. The only thing I really could say I haven't tried, I think that I know of is uh, like the sweet potato tank. I've never really jumped on that trend yet. I want to, cause I think it'll be fun. It'll look kind of cool, but I don't think it's going to be like, yep, I run 32 tanks and they all run sweet potatoes. Now I think it'll just be like, that's a fun thing over there. So, and I have, so I ran like a, a big fish bowl holds 28 gallons and I ran it with no filtration. So there's no heater, no air. It just sat in a spare bedroom and it would breed shrimp. It would. It was incredibly boring to me. And that's why I don't do more of that of like, yeah, I like to see my fish grow. I like to see them uh, breed at a faster rate. I like to see, um, you know, I like, I'm a, I'm a tech nerd. I like to play with things, I like to, you know, develop things. So, uh, but, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways to do the hobby and uh, you should do whichever one you enjoy. So. Yeah, burnout's a real thing. Making enjoyable is key. Yeah, most times when I burn out, and I, I probably burn down more than most people. I, I just dial it back to like, wait, what parts do I enjoy? And then I go, why don't I do that part? And then it becomes enjoyable. So, you know, there's sometimes like I actually do enjoy cleaning sponge filters. I don't enjoy cleaning canister filters. Do I still have canister filters? Yes, I do. Right. So there are parts I enjoy, parts I don't enjoy. And uh, mostly the learning part. That's why I've tried so many things. Like, ooh, that sounds like it'd be fun to learn. Um, so that's just my own thing. And in fact, today when I was feeding my fish, I got done with my workout. I go feed my fish. And I was thinking, I wonder, I bet you I don't feed my fish enough. And I was starting to think about some of the fish that aren't growing as fast as I'd like, even with auto feeders and stuff. And I go... I don't spend enough time evaluating how many fish are in my tank and should I increase the amount of food. Every tank gets food, like here's a big pinch of this and that and here's this. But I was thinking maybe I should do a video or a series and figure out how much can my ecosystem digest. I was starting to think about, we know that fish to get optimal growth, they consume about 2% of their body weight a day in commercial like food fish settings. And I was starting to think, I wonder since I've got all these, you know, 40 breeders, how much food can one digest between the snails, between the microorganisms, between the fish or the bacteria? Like I haven't seen moldy food in probably 12 to 15 years in any of my tanks. And so like, I think I'm so far from overfeeding that I might be underfeeding. And I thought maybe that's a worthwhile thing to see. Like, should I be feeding more? Would I get better coloration on my fish? Would I get more breeding? Would I get more fry surviving in the colony ways in which I breed them? And I don't have the answer. So when I don't have the answer, a lot of times I go, yeah, maybe when I get back from being out of town, maybe I'll run that and try to run two tanks and just see like how you know, too much waste or anything, really. It's mostly I'm afraid or not, not, I'm just not afraid. Yeah, that's, that's a complacent place to be when you're not afraid. Like I, I have a lot of water change. I have all these things helping me. I'm not afraid to overdo it. And so I think I could uh, experiment. And so I, I probably will. Uh, let's see. Have I ever thought about developing a fine chain mail net for Cory's, Plecos, and other catfish? I haven't. Uh, the the best, in my opinion, the best way to catch things that have barbs and, and stuff like that would be using either a plastic cup or there's some specialized, uh, they call them, I guess, nets, but they're basically like a, a cup thing that holds water and you can catch them. Uh, I, I think you'd still like find some fins get caught in between some chain links and stuff. And then there's also the water aspect of it and the, the the crux, like when you're trying to experiment with a product, the crux is, you know, first you got to find out wh what, what am I dealing with? So I could make something like that cup on a stick, basically, and there's zero chance any barb or anything will get stuck in it. But the crux of that is it also moves incredibly slow through the water. You can't catch anything. 
So a lot of times what you have to do is like catch something with a real net and hold it and then go get this other apparatus to get in there and get the thing in there and lift it out. Um, and so I think with the chain mail, you're going to be, you know, maybe you're moving 10% faster than a cup, but now you're introducing 10% that a fin or something gets pinched into the chain mail or the fineness of it. And so it might be one of those experiments where you come out on the other end of like, it is different, but I can't say it's better. And we've run, I run to that a lot with the stuff I test and I try to, in, not, maybe not invent, but improve upon. Sometimes I just come out going, it is different, but I can't say that it's better. I can't say just because it's different, it is better. It's just different. So yeah, a lot of, that's always sad when you get to the end of like all that work. And I think it's just different, not better. You can regulate nitrates with plants if you have a bright light that uses more waste. Uh, that's that's half true. You could run into CO2 limitations or other um, like other nutrient deficiencies, but yes, some of that is true. Has anybody made rapashi and frozen it? I have. Uh, a lot of times it'll stick to each other when you freeze. So if you can if you can lay it out on a tray and freeze it in its own cubes and then pack it and get all the air out, it's easier to take chunks out. If you just kind of put it into a thing while it's uh, not frozen, it'll kind of, the, the moisture there will freeze it together and you got to kind of break it off. That works a little bit. And then I've seen people use like parchment paper and stuff and that's that's really way better, but uh, you know, it, it's a lot of work and I'm, I'm not willing to do that much work when I can just make it fresh and cut it and it's as easy, so. I'm slowly downsizing from 15 tanks and a 1300 gallon pond to 300 gallon pond and four tanks. I just can't keep up. Sure. People, you know, people's life cycles are incredibly diverse. And, you know, there's times maybe you're in, you know, maybe you're in middle school right now and then you're in high school and then you're out of school. Maybe you're going to community college or not. Maybe you got a couple years free. And then maybe you've got a certain job that gobbles up all your time and a, a, a hobby. And then you go to, oh, I'm starting a family. Then maybe you, you go through a divorce or something. You got a ton of time. And so your life is long and you can always go up and, and down, right? It doesn't have to be, I'm only a fish keeper if I keep 100 tanks. You're a fish keeper if you have one tank. Well, you don't have to have a tank, right? You just have to have a fish. And so um, there's a lot, there's people that learn way more with just one tank than I'll learn with a hundred tanks because they're spending 20 hours a day learning about it. You know, it happens all the time in science where people focus on one thing for a very long time. They learn so much about it, even though they don't have a lot of resources. Ice cube trays. Yeah, that might work. I, I know we've done a little bit of it, but for me with the ice cube trays and the rapashi, you got to keep it really hot to pour it. And then you end up with the skin on the bowl and all of that. And it, it's doable, but it just, it still work, I guess. Uh, let's see. How would you set up a BBS tank? Let me think here. Baby brine shrimp, 10 gallon, most hatch, then add live. Why not just toss in the eggs in the tank? Uh, so you want to raise brine shrimp in a tank. Yeah, just put the eggs in. I've got a thread on the forum. You can, I do it in a pond, 100 gallons at a time. When they're happy, they're live bearers, and uh, they just make more shrimp. So easy mode. How do you hatch brine shrimp? Mostly, you need some heat. You need some salt water, and you need some eggs. You apply those three, th and some time. You put those together. You hatch out a little baby brine shrimp. You keep that thing happy, it becomes an adult brine shrimp. And that adult brine shrimp, if it's really happy, gives birth to more live brine shrimp when it breeds. Otherwise, if it's not happy and it's stressed out, it lays eggs. And then the cycle continues that way. Um, but yeah, they're kind of cool creatures that, you know, it, it's it's pretty, I guess, I think it's pretty pretty cool that you can basically add an ingredient to an egg and it hatches out, right? You can you can play with triops and, and fairy shrimp and there's there's lots of other, you know, other stuff to play with. And if especially if you're into the, the natural filterless, tankless methods, 
those do have some benefits. If you don't have any flow at all, right, some of those creatures do better in that environment because they're not getting sucked into filters. That being said, something like a Daphnia that molts and multiplies so quick without air typically uh, just ends up consuming all the oxygen and dying. So it, it re reaches that critical mass and there's a big die off. There's So in, in nature, a lot of times what you're going to see with Daphnia and things like that, you're going to see these big boom and bust cycles where Daphnia is kind of small. And then I want to say, yeah, I was looking it up. It's something crazy like... Uh, how often do Daphnia have a, does Daphnia reproduce? It's it's to me it's mind blowing because of exponential growth. Females produce eggs as often as every four days during their breeding season. Uh, these water fleas produce more during April and May because of the temperatures. Um, but yeah, let's see. Okay. How fast do Daphnia multiply? It only takes eight days for a baby Daphnia to grow into maturity and begin breeding. Each Daphnia has 10 babies. If you have 100 Daphnia today, you'll have 1,000 Daphnia in a week. A week after that, you'll have 10,000 Daphnia. So you can see where you start with a modest amount of Daphnia, you start having some success, and you get a little bit busy in life and, uh, you know, a month later, your your culture will just crash because you now have, oh, I've got a hundred million in here. And they're all, each time they they get a little bigger, they, they molt their shell. And so the shells build up on the bottom. They're using up calcium. They're using up oxygen. There's all these things going on. They're creating ammonia, but they're very ammonia resistant, which is nice. Um, but yeah, it's... You know, it's kind of a crazy thing how fast that can get going on you if you're not careful. So usually you got to harvest really heavy pounds at a time towards the end. Otherwise, and for me, what always happens is I get a crash. So I could be harvesting a pound or two at a time. It's an insane amount of Daphnia. And then life hits me, right? Like, oh, no, my wife's got a flat tire. I got to go help. And then this happened and someone's birthday. And pretty soon I didn't harvest for two days and everything's dead because it just literally hit critical mass ran an auction, everything dies, you start over. So that's why you keep a few colonies going. All right, uh, let's see. Let's talk about, if you're a member, you saw that I posted last night, uh, well, two things. So I posted on the community page a reminder about this live stream. Now there's a notify me button you can click. So if you're angry because you don't get enough notifications from YouTube about live streams, you can now click that button and it should help. Uh, two, if you're a member, I put out a, a post last night for cheaper lights. The remaining remainders of our 24-inch light, this is actually a 16-inch light. I'll talk about this in a moment. But uh, the remaining ones we had, we put on discount. And uh, because the new ones that are coming in have a slight upgrade, and some people may or may not want that. Well, everyone will want the upgrade, but some people may find value, some won't. And so... Uh, yeah, so you save like 30-ish dollars on the two-footer, so it's $109.99 down to $79.99, yeah. And, uh, but it doesn't have the new remote. So the new remote, I've got it plugged in right here. I've been, I've been holding it and, and shielding it from the public. Hold on, I gotta make the, I gotta make the, uh, the cord longer. Go go gadget longer cord. So... Ugh, there we go. 12 foot cord, you know how it is. So here we go. We've got, it's making the weird LED digital thing, you know, where it's a light and it does a weird thing, but we now have a digital readout on the remote. So it's currently set at 10%. If I click it up, 20%, 30%, 40%. So now it goes, you know, all the way from 100% down to 10%. And that's just one little visual improvement to help everybody. Instead of going, hey, how many clicks down? Now you can you can say, oh, yeah, I'm running it 40% on my 40 breeder. Or I'm running it 80% on my 40 breeder. And so, yeah, that's just, it's a slight change. And uh, we know that some people would want that. And if they order the old light and don't get it, they'll feel sad. 
and knowing that we're so close, right? And so what was supposed to happen is those lights were supposed to be here today and we unloaded the cargo container and that got delayed by a day. So it was supposed to be tomorrow. So then we're all set, you know, and this is what, this is what makes business harder. We had someone on vacation, then we're offering overtime to people to come in on their day off to help unload this cargo container. And then as of like an hour and a half ago, we were notified that uh, our container has been brought into, what was the, what was the actual language? Let me see if I can find the actual language. I think it was a restricted area, which that can't be good. Let's see here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yes, team, the container was moved by the port to a restricted location. This in turn canceled our pickup appointment we had today and our delivery appointment for tomorrow. As of right now, we have no delivery appointment, so tomorrow's unload is canceled. So that makes it incredibly hard to do business, especially when you're selling out the rest of your lights that you had at a discounted price, knowing that the new one should have been in, and even telling people they're coming tomorrow, and then they don't come. Uh, so hopefully Friday? That's the hope? My birthday's on Friday, we're hoping for Friday. Maybe I get to unload a cargo container for my birthday. On that cargo container, all it is is lights. It's a, a container completely filled with lights. The container in like a week or two after that, that'll have all the freeze-dried food. It'll have the two outlet uh, battery operated air pump. It'll have single outlet battery air, battery powered air pumps, which we might run out of those battery powered air pumps. They have sold like wildfire, which is awesome. And uh, we'll also have the new, you see the bags that I had up here are gone. That's because I had to get them over to, uh, over for photos. So those will be available as well when that container finally comes. So yeah, you know, trying to pin stuff down and it just gets difficult. This is how I, you know, how I end up never know what I'm going to do each day because you, the day started was I was going to try to unload a cargo container at 9 a.m. and then work out afterwards. And then I got the notification wasn't going to happen today. So then I got to work out at normal time, normal live stream time, and then container tomorrow. Now that's gotten scrapped. So maybe I got to move, ship some stuff around and uh makes it really hard when you're like yeah on my birthday i'm just gonna film a video for youtube well maybe i'm not anymore so <clears throat> all right is there a good way to add minerals into water without installing a system my landlord just installed a water softener uh into our aquarium wait is there a good way to add minerals into water without installing a system my landlord just installed a water softener into our apartments, which is a pain. So if I'm correct, water softeners, most of them are using salt to actually soften the water and not so much an RO unit pulling out minerals. So you probably have the minerals, but now you just also have some salt added to it. Now, depending on how much salt is coming in, you might have a little bit of trouble with plants or not, but... I would say it's like 50-50. 50% of people just have no problem at all and like just keep doing what you do. If you do run into a bunch of, of problems with the salt, the the answer is not great. You could either go with like an RODI unit and you'd have to like put the extra water, the, the wastewater like into your, let's say your uh, uh, bathtub and have like a whole garbage, 55 gallon garbage Rubbermaid full of good water and reconstitute it or what i would do is i would probably if if i actually ran into that problem i was like oh man i'm having a lot of problems with the the salt in there i would probably just start doing water changes with uh store-bought water but my goal would be to get down to I, I water change once a year once every six months something where i am relying more on uh less fish more plants and an ecosystem that is not as heavy so that my water changes are, are fairly low and I might even scale down tank. So instead of having an 800 gallon tank, maybe I have a 30 or 40 breeder or something like that. And once every four to six months, perhaps I, uh, you know, grab a five gallon thing of water, you know, like those big jugs that you'd put on a water thingy 
and maybe I would uh, swap five gallons of water, right? But I, I suspect you're probably on the other end of, yeah, maybe you're going to be okay, get some more hardier plants like Anubias and Java ferns and Balbitis and uh, uh, Crinum, those type of things. Linda says, I've got no problems with my water softener. My plants do well. Yeah, I it, it depends. There's some that, uh, you know, there, there's some that, like in a well situation where you're sprinkling water like around or salt around the well, sometimes that can get way too salty. Sometimes people have systems cranked up a ton. Sometimes there's a different actuator than just the salt too, so... Is marine salt bad for plants in high quantities or high concentrations? Yes. In very low quantities? No. I find it beneficial, actually, in, in very low quantities. Do I recommend floating plants like frogbit or salvinia? Sure. They're fun. If you've never kept them, play with them. Uh, I find that over time... Um, yeah, over time, they kind of get where they grow so fast that they're more work than I want for the amount of tanks I have. Uh-oh, I just got word my lawnmower is broken. Always something. Maybe I can spend my birthday uh, getting my lawnmower fixed. I don't even know what's wrong with it yet. When's my next fish room tour? Hmm. Do I have that info? I know I was talking with Matt about uh, one of the species yesterday or the day before, so I don't think it's this Friday. Let me see. Let me see if I can see what this Friday's video is. Oh, nope, that's scheduled for April 21st, April 14th. Yep, I have a video, an 11-minute video, if you can imagine this, on Vallisneria. <laughs> Whoa. You gotta be a nerd to enjoy that one, which probably we most of us. Yeah, my lawnmower that took two years to get fixed? No, my new lawnmower, the one that I bought while I was waiting for that other lawnmower to be fixed, apparently has something wrong with it. And so uh the original one that was having problems will be the one finishing my lawn currently. It's being mowed. And you know, we're like halfway on that beast, so. Always something. Always something. Yeah, I'm now buying another lawnmower. We're actually, uh, I'm trying to convert most of my property into clover fields. And uh, we've hired landscapers and stuff. And we're doing only native plants. So my, my goal is actually to get it as close to back to nature while kind of being aesthetically pleasing. And only having to mow like once or twice a year, maybe. That's where I'm trying to go. So, but while we're doing that, it, you know, you got to keep it up a little bit. So, yeah. Okie dokie. I bypassed the water softener for my outdoor faucet. Yeah, that's, uh, I definitely have helped people in the store where they, maybe you install a water softener or something like that in your garage. And a lot of times what you can find is there may be a few outside water spigots that get their water before going through it. The other thing you can do in a home scenario is actually make that happen. But in an apartment building, who knows, right? Like that's, you, you might be able to get water from outside, but they're not going to plumb a special line all the way into your, you know, your apartment. So, you know, it's, uh, apartments make it harder. That's all it is. Okie dokie. Robot lawnmowers, yeah, they robot lawnmowers can only do like isn't it up to two acres, so that's we're on ten acres with like four to five of it mowable. Yeah, I I don't want to buy another lawnmower though. I I, I think I'm single handedly killing the planet in lawnmowers. I own two, and a push one that we still have. So, yeah, I want to keep it. Oh wait. Here's a tank. 400 gallon tank. I want to keep a Firemouth, Convict, Electric Blue Cars, and Tiger Barbs. Yeah, that worked fine. Big tank. You can do anything you want. 
with epiphyte plants and floating plants. Should work. I don't see, you know, outside of one one fish being just a lone bother, should be fine. My boss wasn't interested in being part of your retail partner program, so I had to take an order yesterday direct from you guys. I was really looking forward to sell the amazing co-op goods. Yeah, it's a... Uh, I, I think over time, we'll become a... I, I, like, I'm going to say a household name. Yeah, we, we've talked about it like Zenzo, Randy, and I, we have meetings like... We're not trying to actively grow the the uh, retail partner stores in that we don't want to incentivize them. Like we'll give you a discount or anything like we want people that want to uh, be a retail partner store because they want to participate in something that is trying to make the hobby better. And they understand the ideals and not just be, you know, pirate, pirate, uh, pirate Corey's, discount aquarium shop that will undercut everybody and like sell them out the back door or something right we want it so that as these stores and dealers kind of come together our buying power is greater we all have the same pricing we all have the same no hassle guarantee and uh become this thing that other manufacturers have to compete with like hey they made it really easy to do business over there so we can no longer drag them over the coals. It's uh, always been unfortunate to me that um, most of the wholesalers, they work on the more you buy or the more you negotiate or the different sales rep you have is whether you'll go out of business or not. So you might have Bob, right? You might have Bob is your sales rep for 10 years. And Bob says, oh, you get... 40, um, you know, you get 40% off of all these prices. And then Bob retires. And now you got uh, Linda. And Linda goes, well, I'm not giving up that much of my commission. You get 15% off. And so all of a sudden you have to raise the price by 25% on all of your customers. But your competitor, instead of getting Linda, they got Larry. And Larry goes, oh, you were getting 40? Ah, let's just keep it that way. And then you're the brand new guy. You open up a store tomorrow and you get Dave. And Dave goes, oh, brand new store? You don't, you can't buy that much? 10% off, right? And I've just always found that to be uh, a very parasitic relationship with the industry of like, you're new, so you get screwed. You've been around forever. Maybe you get a better deal. You get these sweetheart deals. And that doesn't really coincide with the public facing image of all these wholesalers and they'll put on these big events, throw a barbecue and, and do all this crazy stuff. And then, uh, you know, we're all, oh, we care about the hobby. And then meanwhile, they'll be screwing people, you know, and they do weird stuff. Like I know there's a, uh, you know, for a while they're at the super zoo event, there were vendors that if you went there and you purchased from them. So if aquarium co-op flew into Vegas and we go, let's place, $100,000 order with this company for products. They would then hand you cash to go gamble with, so that way it didn't, didn't hit the IRS and stuff like that. So it was like, and that goes on in all these kinds of things. But our, our goal is like straight shooter. You know, we're going to, oh, you want, you want, we got to ship something to you and you're across the country? Guess what? Pay for the shipping. We'll charge you exactly what it costs. Oh, that thing crapped out? Here's a brand new one. We trust you, right? We have analytics. We and we're gonna do advertising for you. We're gonna help you. I'm gonna tell people to go buy from your store. And uh, but I think long term, that way of doing business should win. It's so far it's winning. It's growing. We get new stores applying all the time, and uh, the ones that make sense that aren't, you know, Pirate Corey's backyard, uh, sell it half broken Emporium, make it through. Not that anyone we've turned down is only that, but there's criteria and stuff we look at. And, you know, we, really it's educated guessing because you never know. You can sign up an account today and they sell the business or someone else is managing it tomorrow, that kind of stuff. So we can only do so much. But our goal is that, uh, you know, you'll get an even experience from any aquarium co-op 
retail partner store that you go to. That would be the hope. Okie dokie. Um, scanning questions. Any tips for planting carpeting plants such as dwarf baby tears and dwarf hair grass in nothing but eco-complete? I personally like to plant those type of plants that have fine root structures in the pot. So there's a couple things you could do. You could take that pot, and let's say you've only got this much substrate, and you're going, the pot's taller than that. You could technically cut the bottom part of the pot off, as in like take your scissors and just literally cut that pot in half. Then I take that pot and I put it in the substrate so that the substrate is even with the top of the rock wool and the pot. So what happens is you've got all these fine roots and they're being held and they've been grown that way for like four months at a farm. And you keep that root structure intact. There is also food inside of that rock wool, usually ammonia. You plant that in and as it keeps getting light and CO2 and things like that and nutrients from the water, it's eventually wants to grow and your whole goal is it hops outside the pot in your eco complete and keeps hopping and eventually you got a carpet. That's what I did with my pearl weed tank, as you'll see in an update coming up. Um, but when I watch people in traditional planting would be you get the pot, you open it up and you might take a pot of uh, dwarf hair grass and you go, okay, I've now got 40 pieces of dwarf hair grass and I'll plant this one and I'll plant this one, and I'll plant this one, and I'll plant this one, and I'll plant this one. And you keep doing that over and over and over and over again for a few hours. And then you come back the next day and you go, oof, okay, 40%, lift it out. And I plant this one, and I plant this one, and I plant this one, and I plant this one. And you keep doing that for a week, and eventually it'll probably work. But I find it to be very tedious, and sometimes it doesn't work. Because maybe you didn't know that oh, it's eco-complete, I should be overdosing on the fertilizer to make sure that it absorbs more fertilizer to get ready for when I'm going to put plants in. Now, it comes pre, that's why it comes wet, it's already loaded up, but maybe you're six months into your tank and you haven't been dosing very much and now you want to do a carpet, you'd be pretty uh, nutrient-deprived at that point. So, um, but yes, I much prefer planting it in the pot and letting it spread. You can always come back out, cut the pot out, and it'll fill back in. There's a million ways. I'm not in a, um, in a hurry. I just like it to be, I like it to work and not be, um, you know, having to do it multiple times. So, let's see. I need a net, wait, I need a, why, my brain wants to transpose words. I need a breeder net. What is the website called? Aquariumcoop.com. And you can get a net breeder or you could get the Zis uh, breeder, which is a more expensive but more uh, advanced breeder apparatus. How did I miss the pirate references? Yar, I don't know. Can we get a pirate emoji? Maybe. I'll have to put Lizzie or Matt on that. Someone make a pirate emoji. With the advancement of AI, will or does the co-op use AI for helping customer wait for helping customers with selling product? Uh, no. As far as I know, let me make sure that's true. Mm, yeah, I don't think we've ever used it. We use lots of data and analytics, but uh, I'm kind of just against it because I find that. There's too much uh, nuance in this hobby. And so my, my uh, example would be, let's say you were going to the doctor and you had something wrong with you. And there was just a chat bot there, right? And there's a chat bot. And you're just plugging in the answers. Yes, have sore throat. No fever. Uh, yes, like Reese's peanut butter cups. No this, no that. Because you're just like making the choices, it's going to spit out an answer with all of your bias. But a human, hopefully, that's really trying to diagnose something might recognize the biases already and go, 
Well, you know, we didn't ask, you know, are you overweight? But I can clearly see you're overweight. And therefore, I actually think this is the problem. And so being that we deal with fish health and disease and that kind of stuff so often and human emotions so often, there's a big difference between um, just someone being upset because something's broken, someone being upset because it's been delayed, someone being upset because a fish has passed away, and AI has a hard time recognizing those, which it can. It can actually detect emotions in pictures and stuff, but um, dispensing the right amount of care, and, and really, it's I just call it like bedside manner, even though we're not bedside, we're doing customer service or, or selling product. It's, uh, you know, we, we use technology to amplify a human skill. So like, we'll have something... We'll schedule a post, but we won't, you know, ask like an artificial AI chat, like, tell me everything I need to know about sponge filters. That being said, I know several creators I'm on a first name, first name basis with that are creating blog articles and, and things like that that way. And, you know, it does a pretty good job, but there are just things that, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, you really got to proofread and, and. I, I, I do wonder what it will be like down the road. And let's say you have something, write an article for you. Is that your opinion? So that when you're in a live stream or you're in a video. And so like we wrote, we ran into that challenge years ago when we hired Irene. So Irene has girl talks fish, right? And she has her own opinions and they'll be different than mine. She likes to, uh, dip plants in alum and stuff like that. And I don't, right? And so we've had talks about the aquarium co-op operates on Corey's knowledge, my knowledge, because I'm the one in front of a camera live with people. And so we try to make it so that when we're reviewing the articles and everything, is this what the company and Corey believes so that when I'm on stage somewhere, when I meet or shake your hand somewhere, that all the information lines up. And then we also experience that in customer service. Because as you hire people on, maybe one person says, I use this medication, Corey uses this medication, the next person doesn't use any medication, and uh, we need it to be a uniform uh, response to people. We ran into it in the retail store as well. You get one employee saying, that's why we developed the trio, is like, I like to use this, the next person uses this, they come in on their day off, they're not here anymore, and what do you mean I should have used this other thing? Oh no! Well, why would you hire that person, you know? And so it led you, you can have two medicines, right? You could have ICX and another thing that treats like salt. Let's say it's salt and ICX. Both will treat ick. One employee says use salt. The other employee says use ICX. The person comes back a week later. My fish died. They're talking to whatever the other employee is. And they're going, yeah, I would use ICX. Well, no wonder. Why that employee tell me to use salt? No wonder they all died. The reality is those fish could have died anyway, right? And so getting everybody on the same page really helps an entire brand educate people and not confuse people more because usually in times of crisis, sick fish, people, anything, people are at their most confused state. So if everybody's on the same page, ICX, ICX, these three blog articles, ICX, oh, the only medication that they sell on the website for ICX is ICX, oh, the FAQ says ICX, Oh, in the Facebook group says ICX. Oh, on the forum, ICX. Oh, in the videos, five different videos about ICX. They can stay on the same page as opposed to, well, you know, one time you did talk about this other one. And we see that a lot. I, if I mention something once, people will bring that up for the next 10 years. You know, one time you said, like, yes, one time I did say that I would eat a salad. It's true. I'm planning to do a dirted tank. Do I have any suggestions? My first suggestion is don't. But my second suggestion is if you're going to, no more than a quarter inch of dirt. I already know the rest of the internet says do, you know, like 10 to 12 billion yards. But I'm telling you that in my experience, the difference between one quarter inch of dirt and two inches of dirt is nothing for the growth. And a quarter inch, pretty clean. Two inches, 
infinitely dirty every time you want to do something in your tank. So I I would tell you, go with a quarter inch and, uh, you know, that little dab will do you. Do the tube effects worms eventually sink? How would you recommend they be fed to quarries? No, they'll sink or they'll float for days. Uh, feeding quarries, stick them to the glass down below. Other people, which I didn't do that trick really, but they'll stick them to like a spoon or something and the spoon will sink and then they'll eat off of that. Uh, or eventually, I think when they come back into stock, Dean and I will show you how to make the sinkable uh, feeder from, you know, like 70s or whatever. Can Epistogramma cockatoides coexist peacefully with angelfish in the right size tank with enough room? I would say, yeah, I, they could. ETA and the dual air pump. My, my standard response is two weeks, but I think officially, let me look, let me look, let me look. I get updates every week on all the containers. I think our current, which means still on the water, right? That can always change, just as I was talking about earlier. But I believe my current ETA on that container is the, let's see here. Nope, that's an update from Zenzo. I need one from Randy. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Here it is. The, okay, so the container with dual outlet air pumps, the shopping bags, the one outlet air pumps, and the freeze dried foods and other resupply stuff is uh, the ETA to the port is April 18th. So in theory, that would be Tuesday. In reality, it'll probably be like, if we're lucky, maybe they're available on the 21st. If not, it'll be like the 25th. Because ports and stuff don't work on the weekend, or at least delivery truck drivers or whatever don't. So uh, at best, next week. At worst, the following week. More goodies coming in. Casual Aquatic says, a dab will do. I've done an inch of dirt, and he is right. Next was a betta tank kept, also kept cherry shrimp, or wait, cherry barbs. Had a cool look, but the slightest movement did muck up everything. Yeah, from experience, I didn't notice any growth differences. Like, Having dirt does make your plants grow a bit faster. That's true. But the difference between a quarter inch and two inches or an inch, there was no difference that I could tell in uh, in growth. Is there a market in the U.S. for mail-order tissue culture plants from my experience? Or not worth the hassle? Seem more popular across the pond? Uh, there is some market. And... I think the, the biggest problem we have is they're more expensive than normal plants. Where when you go across the pond, they're usually the same price or maybe even a little bit cheaper. So it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people when they're more expensive for a smaller plant. In rare plants, it makes some sense. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, still, we're still trying to figure out how are we going to crack that code that makes sense long term. We just haven't done it yet. It's on our agenda, though. We were talking about it on Monday. Like, we need to spend some time and think about that some more. But we've got some more pressing things we're working on, some new products and stuff. A little, little too, well, it's more like updates to products. How to manage corridor breeding colonies that have had a population boom? Mm, sell them. That's what I always did. I just always colony bred my corridoras, fed them lots of food. They'd breed a bunch. Then I would net a bunch out and take them and sell them. That's how I managed my population. Even when I didn't own a store, I would sell them to another store. Is there a set time of the week that the scratch and dent items get listed on the website? Uh, no, they go up as they find. So what happens, I asked about this Two weeks ago, actually, I asked, was there a set day? And no, there's not. 
um, I was talking with the employees and basically just during the week, if they go, oh man, this thing, they just put it in a bin and they keep getting put in the bin, right? And then when there's downtime, so if you guys don't order a bunch or there's extra staff or whatever, then someone goes over and goes, time to sort the bin. And they start sorting the bin. They got to print out different tags so that that way when it gets ordered, they go and pick the one that's got the dented box or the return or whatever it is and ship that out instead of one off the shelf because then inventory gets messed up. And uh, some of the things that land in the box might be like, we've never had a damaged one of these or return yet. And then they go into a different box to get pictures taken because we like to take a picture of what would a dented box look like or what are we even talking about here? And then those will go up probably the following time. And sometimes it could be multiple times a week. Other times it could be a few weeks. We might be, you know, training people or trying to get a project done in the warehouse. And uh, so there is the the only thing I think you could do you could you could do a uh, an alert I think. But no, there's no uh, there's no dedicated scratch and dent day type of thing. We've considered saving them up and trying to do like an event like. Uh, you know, like REI or something does, but then we got to store a bunch of stuff that's its own inventory nightmare. And, uh, so we just, you know, basically if you keep checking, that's the, the best way is, you know, when you think about it, go, oh, let me take a look. Ah, it's the same crap. There you go. Any updates on getting Japanese rice fish in? I didn't know we were waiting for an update. Uh, if you're talking about the retail store, ask Brandon, he would be the one bringing any in so i don't know i for all i know we have five different varieties or we have none at the moment i am unaware what do i suggest for tub stocking options um i would say watch the live stream we did a few weeks ago about putting fish outdoors you get a lot of ideas there rice fish would be one of them my corridor is a stop breeding I'm not sure what it's about. The only thing I can think of is there's too many of them in the current tank. So usually corridors will still breed, even if there's a lot in there, those eat the eggs. But like I was saying at the beginning of the live stream, we're creatures of habit where we feed the same amount often. And so if you had six adult corridors and they were breeding, and then you had 11 fry and six adults, and now you have 17 adults, if it's the same food each time, there's probably just, oh, everybody's getting one slice of pizza for dinner instead of two. And, oh, it turns out corridors breed at two slices of pizza for dinner. And so you might just have to up the food a bit. And then, oh, now they're building the fats and the things they need to start developing eggs. Then they'll start breeding. They'll start making more. That was my, the way I always bred the corridors was whenever they stopped, I just needed to put even more food in, which seemed crazy, but it, it worked. I know hang on the back filters come with instructions on how to frequently re wait. Yeah, how frequently to replace and buy new media, but how often do they really need to be replaced? Activated carbon, white floss. Activated carbon usually roughly once a month, although I don't run activated carbon in any of my aquariums. White floss when flow slows down. That could be as soon as 3 hours after you put it in. Three days, maybe even a couple weeks. Um, but I, I run those when I need to polish my water. But I run a lot of bio rings, sponge, other reusable stuff that should be usable for 10 plus years pretty easy. Do we ship dry goods to Canada? We don't. But a, a store we have partnered with in Canada called uh, uh, April's Aquariums, they do sell online. And... I feel like, do we maybe have one more Canadian store? I, I want to look now because I, I want to make sure they get a shout out if we have more than one. They don't ship online, but they, we might have another Canadian store. Let me see. Let me see. Zoom out on my map. We do. I knew it. So we have... April's Aquarium, which does ship online. And then we have... Oh, wait. They just have two locations. I'm tricking myself. They've got one in Vancouver and one in Burnaby. I thought there was one more. Is there any on the East Coast? Mm, not that I'm seeing. 
Got to zoom out some more. Nope, that's the only ones. So yeah, April's Aquarium, order them online. Sitting on a bucket, watching my new Odessa barb fry. Listen to a live stream. Yeah, it's amazing. I don't know how many hours I sat on a bucket, but it's a lot. Dean and I were sitting on buckets working at the store expansion on the weekend. Our freshwater sponge sought after in the aquarium hobby. I have a wait. Whew. I don't know if I f f a f a f, f a dacia species. I, I'm not saying that correctly. In a few of my tanks, I'm wondering if it could be profitable to breed and sell. Well, I think like anything, uh, I don't think there's a market for it yet. If you were to create the market and all the hype and everyone wants to keep a freshwater sponge, could it be profitable? Yes. But if you could do all of those things, uh, then I would say like there might be other products to do that with instead. They'd be more profitable if that was the case. Mm, let's see. Medicating a fish tank when... Wait. Medicating a fish tank when unsure what's going on. Also after an ammonia spike, is there a medication with a wider spectrum that won't hurt Corydoras? Mm. This is like juggling a loaded gun with this question. No. I'm just going to say no, because you can't really say that no medication will not hurt a fish. There's always that chance. So being that you have an ammonia spike, fish are already compromised a little bit. That's not great. Um, the widest spectrum thing would be salt. You could do a little bit of salt, but corridors don't love salt, so you can't go very high. But the recommendation would be narrow it down in some way. Use that symptoms. What are the fish doing? Do I visually see something? You know, we don't when you're when you're super broad, it's hard to catch what's actually happening. So if you can even I if you can even just get it like a little bit closer, like oh it's bacterial, or oh it's fungal, or oh it's parasites, or oh it's gill burn from the ammonia spike that happened, that ups the odds considerably. But yes, if you if you really had no idea, and that happens sometimes, you're like, even for me, I can't explain what's going on. Um, there are still some shotgun approaches, and for me, that would be if it's something on the outside that I think of the outside of the fish. That's Ickex and Marison combined. If I thought it was something on the inside of the fish, I would do Paracleanse. But any information... You know, each little tidbit is going to get it so much closer. 20 gifted memberships from Alexander Inglehart. Nice. And I think someone else donated some earlier. I, I fall behind on those because I'm in the chat talking too long and then I scroll past it. So my thank you to those that that might put us that put us over 4,000. Let's see. Do we have members? Where do I see members is it here? Memberships. Uh, I don't know if that's true. But I feel like it was at 3,980, maybe like yesterday. It's also still today, it says total members 3,980. I feel like that should be a real time number though. Hmm. So maybe we're 20 away, or maybe it's lagging. Although. Looks like 31 days ago, we had 3,937. So, we have made progress. How do, can I get a gifted membership? Usually there should be a little thing popping up in your chat that says, ooh, I'd like to opt into that. And the more you hang out, if you watch videos from, you know, the more minutes you watch, the more likes, the more comments, the more you interact with the channel in any way, the more likely you are to be next up to get one of those free memberships. That being said, 
you know, you got to you got to be active and there could be someone around the corner camping that spot watching all them videos. All of them. All right, let's see if that Alexander busting out with 20 more. Let's see if that updates. It hasn't updated yet. Let me Is there another I feel like there should be another maybe in analytics. Maybe Mm. Mm. I hate YouTube. Makes my life hard. Did uh the person asking did they get one yet? I don't even know. MT got one. All right. <laughs> Mighty Joe says buying a membership's cool too. That's right. Is Camelanus worth treating? Yes. Use Expel P or get yourself some Levamisol. Expel P is Levamisol. Uh, it is worth treating. I, th I find fairly easy. That being said, you'll always hear people like, I killed everything. Like, people that die from, you know, choking on a popsicle or something. Like, it, it, there's always going to be like, there was something I was reading this the other day where I like, killed everything. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And it's like, okay, well, I've treat, treated like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fish just fine. But there's always a chance for failure. Is my taco hat ever coming back? It's in the other office. So it's still there, but uh, oh, I'm sure I'll break it out for a special occasion. Uh-oh. My wife made a grave mistake. She accidentally hid... Uh, What's the name? Mm, Tony Fast. Can I unhide him? I don't know that I can unhide him live. It's, it's a needle in a haystack, but I will, I will work on it while I answer questions. That's that's one of the YouTube needs to fix that. Whenever you ban somebody or anything, they add it to a list and it's not alphabetical. And with all the porn spammers and everything, that list is like forty thousand people long. And now I got to like just randomly scroll until it's like, hey, there's Tony Fast. Get back in here, buddy. And so that's why I've always had the stance when people say like, when we ban you, it's like if you're being not nice, we just ban you. There's no going back because I don't want to spend the next four hours trying to unban you. Uh, but in this case, when it's an accidental banning, we're going to spend some time to unban you because that's not fair. And so it's just a needle in a haystack of like, oh, jeepers. Here we go. And, uh, yeah, I really wish they'd make a search feature that would just let you search up someone that got banned. That would make life so much easier. So much easier. I adopted a new better from someone in the suburbs near me. I love him. I'm good. Oh, my dog's barking. I've discovered a colony of small brown bugs on the top Loading plants, my 10 gallon. What are they and are they bad? No idea and no idea. Post a picture on the forum or the Facebook group. Someone smarter than me will probably know what that bug is. I'll probably just go, mm, I don't know. It's 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 a mm, I don't know. Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can find. Uh oh, it's not finding it. Uh oh. Nope. Let me scroll to the bottom. Oh no. Let me show show three thousand six hundred and thirty one more. Scroll to the bottom. Does that get us to the bottom? Let me see if. Let's see. What is this? Okay, we're closer. Nope. I don't know, I can't find Tony Fast. Is it all one word? Two words? Don't know. We'll get you out of there sometime, buddy. I finally got around to watching the at Egg Scatter members only talk. You all weren't kidding. That was amazing. That's right. I think it's next Saturday is another one. Let's see, first, second, third Saturday. Should be the 15th, I think. I think it's Anthony Maserol talking about... I'm not even sure he's talking about. Amazon Research Center, maybe? I'd have to look. I thought I had hard water calcium stains on my glass. 
but I have no KH. KH isn't doesn't measure hardness. GH does. Um, yeah. So also G well, even GH it measures calcium and magnesium, but you could have a high GH and have no calcium in your water still. So you still may have calcium stains. It's hard to hard to know. Are we still selling the Gen 1 lights at the retail store? I don't think we have them out on display, but uh, we have some more. So if you're Jones and for some, you could probably go get some. We could probably make that happen. The Duke, no control F. Come on, bro. I live on a computer. Yeah, control F doesn't work. That's normally how I have a chance. But it, it I hate, like, my screen is this big. It's literally one, two, it's four chat, like four chat lines big and thousands of names and on half the things, it'll only search what's visible on the screen. Sometimes it'll search the whole box, which it, once I opened it up, it seemed to search the whole box, but yeah, Antonio, we've got Scott one. We've got uh, Hadley Cape Breton who got banned. We have Braxton Penrod that got banned. Uh, yeah, but Tony, there's only C.C.AF Tony T, and that's it. So I don't know what happened to Tony. Maybe, maybe you only hit his comment, and I'm searching in a needle in a haystack that doesn't need to search. All right, I'm gonna sneak out early, out of work early so I can eat some cheeseburgers. Oh, Randy Will Bandy eating cheeseburgers. Trailer Park Boys. Uh, I have an air pump that won't switch to battery power mode when unplugged. Is there something special I can do? Well, that's bizarre. I would say uh, take a little quick video and. Send it to our customer service. Our customer people, customer service people will watch it. And if we go, hey, that's not how it's supposed to work, we're going to ship you a new one. Assuming it's our air pump. I assume that. Like, I don't think you'd be asking me if it was like, this random cobalt one that's 10 times the price isn't working. But assuming it's ours, and that was that way, we'll just ship you out another one. But we'll also want to troubleshoot because we want to, we also want to figure, get to the bottom like, wait, why is this thing not working? What's going on here? How many gallons per pump does the Fritz Dechlorinator treat? The same as the Easy Green. One pump, 10 gallons. Boom. <laughs> My wife figured it out. Tony's back. <laughs> Woo! It's good to hear. We were, we were a... We were a man down for a bit. All right. So, wait, did that... <laughs> did that planer get actual use or was it a placebo? Yeah, in a picture we posted, there was a planer in the background that Alexander had spotted. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was used. And, uh, yeah, Joel is a man of perfection. And, uh, yeah, so all the tools can be there or not be there at the shop. They get loaded in, loaded out, depending on usage. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a long road ahead to finish that build out, but we're getting close. Well, I say we're getting close. Like, there are things that you could spend a ton of time on, and it doesn't feel like you've done anything. And then, like, when you're plumbing tanks, like, oh, man, I'm getting closer. But you still got to, you know, like, we got floors to grind. We got flooring to lay. We got painting to do. We have some electrical. We have a second water heater. We got uh, a checkout area. We have a little bit of network cable to run. I've got a new Murphy camera to set up. I got to set up the new Murphy tank. I got to put it in the background. Like, there's still a bunch of stuff. But, um, you know, getting some of those milestones, like checkpoints done, that always feels good. Like, yeah, look at that. That thing's pretty much done. Uh, let's see here. 
are bladder snails harmful to a quarry breeder colony? They finally found a way in. Uh, everything I've ever bred has had like a billion snails. So in my cases where it's like, oh no, I have 400 orange laser corridors to sell. Maybe I'd add 500 if I didn't have snails. But never affected me enough to matter for me. That being said, I'm sure there's like, oh, I would have bred this if it wasn't for those pesky snails. But I get all the benefit of feeding my puffers, so I like them. I'll make my rapashi in a Tupperware, cut it, then dump it out onto a baking sheet with parchment paper, let it freeze overnight, then I put it in a small container. Yeah, um, I've done that as well, Caitlin. My problem, and it's probably maybe unique to me, is in a store or my fish room setting, it takes so long to feed all the fish that if I'm feeding out of that container, by the time I'm done, it's a little bit melty. Like that that outside layer melts a little bit. So then you put it back in the fri or freezer, and then it kind of becomes... You can still break it apart, but... Uh, whereas if you were just like take two or three pieces out, put it back in the freezer, they'd stay, uh, split up. Love the upgrade to the air pump. Being able to adjust the airflow is awesome. The new one seems to push out a lot more air as well. Great job. Well, thank you. We continually try to improve our products. We're not always successful. Right now, I, what, what I work on today, I worked on new sponge filter improvements that's what we're working on right now is some sponge filter things but i mean i've got like another fifty thousand to sell so even if i crack the code tomorrow it's probably a year before we're like into the next set of them and there's nothing groundbreaking but uh you know just always if i spot something i can't not be like you know what we should mm, i wonder if we could do that and then i write on a list and eventually I pick something on a list and I go, I'm going to try that. And so I made some mock-ups and we've gotten some three. So the Duke helped us with some 3D printing stuff. We tested that for a while. We now sent that to the printers, printers, uh, or not printers, manufacturers. They made some, not as good. So back, we're back to yelling at them like, hey, do better. These aren't as good. Uh, and we're seeing if they can do that. I've got a couple other things I want to do but I want them to all happen at the same time because the other two make no sense unless the first one makes sense. So it's it's weird. Some products get that way where, yeah, that won't make sense unless this is already happening though because that's working against it otherwise. How can you improve the perfection with sponge filter? Well, that's why I'm at the top of the company because I can make very, very slight adjustments that... Uh, a fraction of nerds will be like, that is amazing. And then those nerds will tell normal people that, hey, these things work awesome and you should use them. And those normal people just go, yeah, I've used it and I never had a problem. That's that's basically how our company works. I impress a nerd like Dean. Dean goes, this thing's amazing. Some other person listens to Dean. And then pretty soon you've got, you know, 10,000 people going, hey, this thing's awesome. And it happens all the time. You guys watched it happen with freeze-dried foods. Freeze-dried foods have been around forever. All we did is make sure ours were fresh and not burnt and didn't suck. And then all of a sudden, they're like, things are amazing. Why is everybody doing this? And it's like, well, this doesn't have any marketing. Like, these companies, in my opinion, these companies have, like, no marketing. When you go onto their Facebook and you just, like, pull up a random, like, Fluball is doing, like, the best and even, you know, you just, you're just like, oh, it's not even that good, really. But you go to some other companies. Like, I, I want to say I was looking at someone popped up from, like, API. Let's see. Uh, API Aquatics? What? Are, pharmaceutical? What do they go under? I can't even pull them up. Oh, API Fish Care. That's what it is. That's what it is. All right? And they posted, you know, they posted a thing April 10th at 6 a.m., and uh, they got, you know, 10 likes and a comment. And the thing before that got eight, eight likes and a comment. And what's so mind-blowing to me is this is a worldwide brand that's been around since I ever entered the hobby 
that's owned by Mars. They make candy bars and all that. They got billions upon billions of dollars, and they haven't figured out Facebook. Like, they existed before Facebook did, and after all of these years, still have not found a way to, like, embrace it. And it's not, like, obviously when you have that kind of money, you can either A, learn, B, hire somebody. Really, those are the two options. And either I try to do both. I try to always learn something about it so then I can hire someone to do it and not end up with, like, uh, you know, some of these companies that have hired social media people and then they don't get any results. It's like, well... Making a post to social media doesn't mean you're good at it. It just means you made the post. Like, just because I trim my lawnmower on doesn't mean I'm good at keeping a good yard. It just means my lawnmower was on, which apparently right now won't even do that. So don't hire me for lawn care. That's what I'm saying. Woohoo, one month. I live in South California. Outdoor mini ponds. Can I do them all year round? Our summers are kind of brutal. I don't know. I don't live in California. I'll tell you what, though, I would definitely try, and I would report back with, did it work or didn't it work? This is too odd. My mail delivered this AM. It just delivered again 20 minutes ago with the co-op package. That's a happy Dan. Well, you know, we do have some of the mailmen that are aquarium co-op fans, so maybe maybe they put in the extra, extra trip for you. Sorry, I'm newer to the hobby. Hey, no worries. We were all there. What is rapashi? Rapashi is a food that comes in a powder. Think of it like a... Let me back up. Imagine you're buying a packet of Jello at the store. You gotta add boiling water. And instead of getting that, you know, cherry or strawberry flavored Jello at the end, you've got... Uh, fish meal and uh and uh like some scallops and some shrimp and you've made the worst smelling jello that you could imagine that would be rapashi and then instead of you eating it you feed it to your fish and they lose their minds that's what rapashi is and because it's in this jello this gelatin it stays water stable so when you put a normal piece of food into water uh, nutrients and stuff like that can dissolve into the water right away. Well, this food, because it's got all the minerals and everything, but it's encased in the jello, the gelatin, it doesn't interact with the water. So it can stay water stable for over 24 hours. So it's kind of a cool thing to really feed your fish a long time or feed nocturnal fish. Or uh, another benefit of rapashi is it doesn't bloat because it's already fully hydrated with water. When you have something like a goldfish or Trophius debosii or any Trophius fish are known to bloat problems they don't have it quite as bad because of uh it's already fully hydrated whereas like a pellet food it soaks water in have you ever had a pellet sit in the water for a long time and it gets bigger that's expanded fully hydrated form and so that can happen inside of a fish's stomach so there's some benefits there um but it takes work and it smells like death so you know you're being new to the hobby, you might not be at the, I'm willing to make everybody else in the house angry to make my fish happy. Sometimes you are at that level, though, in which case you do that. For gifted memberships, does your ranking reset if you buy a membership? I have no idea. Like, this is one of those things where we're, like, trying to game a free system that uh, I, I just don't know. Like... I don't know how to explain it other than there's people that are nice enough to give away memberships and the way it's supposed to work is the people that are most engaged with the channel would receive those memberships. But I have not spent any time trying to figure out how could I game this or how could I be a member forever and not give back. It's supposed to be, the way it's supposed to work is people who enjoy the membership, maybe they buy some gifted memberships, some other people get it, they might enjoy it, they might pay it for and buy someone else one. And then maybe they stay a member, something like that. Um, you know, there's there's ways I would love to improve it. I would love if, like, the Aquarium Co-op could sponsor, let's say, 100 or, or 500 or something uh, memberships for only 15 and under or something, right? Like, there's definitely ways to improve the program. But for the most part, it's meant to kind of get you sucked in 
and like what we're doing is where where they've positioned it. But I, I've told them many times, I would wish I could pay for my employees so they didn't have to pay. I wish I could pay for moderators. I wish I could pay for kids. There's a bunch of ways in which I wish we could optimize. But unfortunately, um, they, haven't, they haven't prioritized those two things yet. So, But Eric Wyrock gave five more. You're five. If you didn't get one, then you're five closer. I, you know, you, you could be number two million or number seven. I have no idea. Can you get ick from baby brine shrimp eggs? Uh, no, not that I've ever seen. You can, well, there are reports you can get hydra, but I actually think that hydra is there and just baby brine shrimp is the best food for that hydra. So I don't think it actually brings hydra in. I just think it feeds the hydra. Uh, let's see. I was the one that asked you about anaerobic bacteria last week. How do you prevent anaerobic bacteria from forming in the easy planter? Um, I don't know that you could necessarily prevent that. I'm trying to think if I would want to prevent that. I'm not sure that I would want to prevent that. You, like, if you put a piece of lava rock in your aquarium... One of the main reasons you would do that is because you want the anaerobic bacteria in the center of it. Um, the only way I could really think of if you were concerned about it would be put an air stone in the, like the bottom of the planter. Air would keep circulation going. I've never run into a problem with it yet, though. So most times I haven't thought, how do I solve this if I haven't run into a problem yet? Maybe an air stone? But I, I just don't think I'm going to run into a problem. I'm totally late, but cooking for the hubby. Well, hopefully it's something good like tacos or miniature corn dogs or a honey mustard chicken salad. Why does everyone think about, wait, what does everyone think about labeling fish as live fish versus no labeling or labeling the fish as live bees? Uh, from shipping fish myself with usps at least you're best off listing them as live fish there is a procedure they go through when they they're known as a live fish whether or not that is going to help you that's hard to say i shipped a ton of fish never labeled them i found that it didn't actually make any difference well i tested and i saw no difference in delivery rates or anything and so therefore i stopped wasting money on live fish stickers i do think there is something to a live fish sticker in terms of marketing, as in when the customer gets it, they will feel like you tried harder. But when you have the analytics of like 10,000 packages and you see that it literally makes no difference, then you got to choose whether like 32 cents per live fish sticker is worth it from the marketing standpoint with your customer. That's really what it comes down to. At least with USPS. And I did a, a bit with FedEx as well, but I did not ship UPS. So I don't have analytical data there. I've got a friend bringing dinner over and hoping it's tacos. Yeah. If, I mean, when they knock on the door, ask what they're holding. And then that's when the door opens. I made French toast for dinner. You're one of those people, the breakfast for dinner people. I've never been able to be one of those people. I kind of want to be, but I, I'm not. The only breakfast for dinner I could really eat, bits and gravy. I can eat that anytime. Could be, could be 10 p.m., 3 o'clock in the morning. Could be 10 a.m., 2 in the afternoon. Could be right now, always. Where's my thermos can cooler? Right here. It's literally right here. Will Aquarium Cooperative sell fish? We sell thousands of dollars in fish every day at the retail store. Are we going to sell it online? No. We like staying in business. We've tried it a bunch of times. You know what happens? Humans. Humans happen. They make it where it is not sustainable. Uh-oh. Is Landon losing his mind? I haven't seen his question. Stocking ideas for an unheated 60 breeder. Do you have any suggestions? My suggestion is watch the video where we have we list fish that are for unheated tanks. Two, there's another video where the whole fish room the guy has is unheated aquariums. 
But really, I would tell you, almost, I would say majority of fish sold in a fish store could probably live in that aquarium if it's in your house. Um, I was measuring it yesterday, in fact. My tanks are running at 71.4 degrees. Everything's hunky-dory so far. I could probably go down a little bit more. So I haven't done it yet. It's now warming up, so I'll probably have to wait to winter to see, like, does everything handle 70 or 69 or 68? My GH is zero from conditioned water, but my KH is the highest on the test strip. What can I do to raise solely the GH, or how would you go about in this case of water? Uh, so let me think. You got zero GH. I would add wonder shells. Do that. Or equilibrium, either one. Mm. It's 1.30 a.m. in Scotland, and it's bedtime, not dinner time. I don't know. You're the underwater cabbage salesman. You can definitely eat at 1.30 in the morning. I've done it. Forget about all the times I asked for a membership. All right. I don't know what the emojis do for you, but that's new to me, and they're fun to hit. Yeah, they're, I can't even, honestly, I can't even see them on my screen. I think only you guys can see them. That was a an update they put in so that people, I think what happens is like, my grandma wouldn't know this is actually live, but when they see the thumbs up and the hearts and the things like that on the screen, then they go, hey, other people are here. And so it's meant to be more engaging. But on my end, I didn't get to see them, which that's kind of a bummer. Opinions on live aquarium or live aquaria? I don't know. I haven't, I don't think I've ordered from them ever. So maybe the chat has got some for you, but I don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will say my mail carrier always notices the live fish sticker and keeps the package in the cab of their truck. All right. That last mile service getting a little change. There might be something to that. Just in our, you know, when we, you know, over lots of packages, you look at death rates, you look at deliverability rates, you look at all these things. We didn't see any uh, statistical anomalies between, or maybe differences between, uh, live fish sticker or non-live fish sticker boxes there what you know there you have more you have more statistical variance with the size of box than you do the sticker actually the bigger the box the more likely that thing won't make it there what do you recommend for breeding guppies as a beginner uh pick a solid color pick a solid color one they sell a little bit easier um to a store sometimes and uh watch videos we got a bunch of videos on breeding guppies breeding them for profit all that kind of stuff lots of fishroom videos because i've bred a lot as well and i like them my mail guy hand delivered my hailstream loaches telling me there's live fish in the box yeah i've actually so we we have live plants and live fish we actually see the opposite too so people are will highlight like the mail carrier like oh he kept it safe for me uh, we also will have people do things like, oh, these are got to be warm. So they make them too warm or they got to be cold. So they'll be too cold. So not only, so like plants out of Florida, for instance, on the box, they'll say keep cool. Well, in Seattle, sometimes they go keep cool, better put those in the freezer. And then they're all dead because they're used to bring in so much crab and salmon and all that seafood. They see keep cool. Their brain thinks keep frozen. So you, you get both ends. And so we've, we've tried boxes that, you know, we, we tried changing the boxes. We actually had custom boxes coming from the farms to try and eliminate that. Then we just started bringing, before COVID, we just start bringing them candy. And then they would know Aquarium Co-op by name. And there was never a problem again. And then COVID happened and they laid a bunch of staff off. And we tried to establish those things back. But basically every time we go to the, the airports now i don't i don't know if we've ever seen the same person like twice it's just like a revolving door of like no one knows what's going on there's like one and a half people with like three quarters of a forklift and uh 
yeah, it used to be you could just show up and get your stuff and go home. Now sometimes you got to show up and you wait four to five hours because legally they have to unload the planes with the mail first and like they're so understaffed that, yeah. Is it still cool I call you Kobe? Sure. It's old school. Just received some Harlequin Rasboras and Mystery Snails from Aquahuna and my mail carrier delivered it in a live animal's crate from USPS. All right. I've got a 60-gallon cube tank. It's 24 inches front to back. If I used two... Sounds like there's another piece to that story. Why did you choose the style of heater instead of a glass tube? Two reasons. One, I wanted to be smaller to hide it away more. Two... It's way cheaper to ship a heater that's this big instead of one that's this big. The difference to me and my company per heater is about $10, which that means the difference to you is at least $10 difference. Every heater that I don't make any money, you don't get a better heater. You literally just pay $10 more for shipping. The more long anything is, the more it's going to cost to ship. So... Let's see. Hit two years, 15 days ago. Right on, Dustin Perez. What would you recommend for a four-gallon tank other than a betta? Shrimps. Shrimps all day, every day. Shrimps, shrimps, shrimps. <laughs> Ooh. I stayed home this morning waiting for an Aquahuna delivery. That's one of the reasons why I yell at so many fish selling businesses is that when you refund... So one of the reasons we weren't super profitable on shipping fish is that I don't think it's good enough that if the fish arrive dead, you refund the money and keep the shipping. Because I, from being a hobbyist myself, know a lot of times you're taking the day off or having somebody wait for them to come for you while you're at work. And so if you buy $50 in fish and it's $25 to ship it and you took a day off from work, when those fish arrive dead, you're actually out like $200. You're not out $50. You're out $200. And so we would always refund if something went wrong. We'd either A, reship at our own cost, which that's mostly what we would do, or you get the $75 back, not just the $50. Because we already understand that even in that instance, you're still bummed. I took a day of work off for this and they arrived dead. I get it. Uh, but to continue Mike's story, it's a good thing I did because the postman stuck the box in my mailbox. They would have been baked today. Usually they bring it to the door. Yes. My words of advice for you. Being that you're in the fish hobby, bribe your delivery people. We do it all the time. Not an actual bribe. Treat them nice. Be super helpful. Like when my guy will drive down the, the the driveway, we try and meet him at the door going, hey, thank you so much for bringing this. You need anything to drink? You know, give him a gift card every once, something. Like they they are the, you know, the difference between like, am I running late today? Ah, I can bring that to him tomorrow. Uh, you want people handling your fish and your plants and things like that to know who you are. Oh, that's this person. They treat me nice. I'll make sure they get that. I'll make sure I don't ace Ventura this thing. Now, it's not 100%, but it's like 90%. You treat someone nice, and magically, your service will be good. So I, I recommend that, especially, um, you know, like, I, I'll be honest. I don't do it for Amazon drivers because it's a different person every day, but, like, my mailman has to deliver some Amazon packages, and, and so, like, Amazon, or I mean, uh, USPS, because they're pretty regular. And then like at the store, UPS was very regular. But some of these other ones, I've never seen the person more than once. So if I start seeing someone several times, then try to build a rapport with them, you'll get better service. And uh, that's real important when you're dealing with live animals and fish and, you know, especially reptiles and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that way, you know, so... 
they've got to, you know, you got to imagine they're on a route and they got thousands of people. Some people are waiting on a check. Some people are getting sued. Some people are, you know, going through a divorce. Some people are waiting on candy. Some people are waiting on fish. Like everybody's got a different problem for the guy or girl delivering. And so if you can at least get on the first name, like, hey, what's your name? My name is this. Hey, what can I do to make your life easier? Oh, you want to drink? Yeah, I got your soda. You want to use a bathroom? Hey, I got a bathroom right there. That'd be great. Uh, anything you can do. And then they're more likely to just make it better on your end, too. And they'll remember when you say, hey, I know you got a lot going on. I get live fish sometimes. If they sit in that mailbox, they'll they'll cook to death. So if you ever see anything that says live fish, if you could just put it like right here behind this bush, that would be great. And I'll bet you nine times out of ten that thing's behind that bush. Now, do know that usually there'll be some substitutes when on vacation and stuff. And so you can still have times where you're like, he, they still put it in the mailbox. A lot of times it'll be the substitute. When you're really good, we've had some really good ones, they'll actually let the substitute know, hey, with this person, don't do this thing. Right. And usually you go pretty far with live animals because nobody, nobody gets up in the morning going, hmm, hope I kill some stuff today. No one wants to do that. So, you know, they're going to try their hardest and, you know, that's all you can ask. Try your hardest. What temperature is too hot for plants and shipping? It's got to be like 90 plus. I would think. Like it actually, they have to actually get 90 plus. Just because 90 out doesn't mean they'll necessarily get 90. But it could also be 80 out sitting on a tar mat and get 95. A lot of fancy goldfish YouTubers say that fancy goldfish have less health problems if kept at higher temperatures of 74 to 78. What do I think? I don't know. I feel like as a YouTuber, we're the most untrusted bunch of people that there is. We've got something to gain. In my experience, I really haven't noticed much of a difference Anywhere from 82 to 60. Fish kept in my care, they kind of just get kept the same way. I also don't have problems with blow. I I don't know. That That's one of those, like, I, I could probably make a case for some, maybe single tail, but maybe not, you know, fancies. But I think it really comes down to a lot of genetics. And you'll find that people, they'll have luck somewhere. They'll just keep buying fish from that place. And they'll be getting it from the same farm. And... So I don't know. I, I There could be something to it, but I have never witnessed it. I've touched a lot of goldfish through my career, but I never, you know, I didn't specialize in goldfish. So if someone's got 10 years in goldfish experience and they believe a thing and you're having good luck believing that thing that they believe, keep doing it. But I wouldn't, if my fish were thriving, I would not go out of my way to be like, well, my fish have been great for five years at 70 degrees. I better crank it to 78. I would just let them keep on keeping on. At UPS, drivers always share tips and tricks for cover. Oh, for covering the drivers on the routes. Good. That's good to hear. I honestly believe most people that work anywhere are trying to do a good job. I mean, that's just the humans in general, they don't want to do a bad job. Now, if it takes a lot of work or something, like, well, then you can cut some corners. I always bake my delivery people fresh cookies in a tin container and ice cold water. That would be... I used to deliver medical oxygen, and it was always such a treat when, you know, like a little old lady or something would be like, we made cookies, you want some? Hell yes, adoptive grandma. Like, I just adopted you. I need cookies. I'm here every Tuesday. You should probably make cookies every Tuesday morning. Turning one of my 10 gallons into green water for raising fish. Um, have you had any success with green water? Yeah. Why don't I ever use it? I do. You probably just haven't been watching for 15 years. Uh, I've got green water right now. I, I definitely love it for raising rainbow fry. I love it for healing stuff. I find fish do better in green water when they have uh, like any kind of skin issues. But in general, I find it difficult to keep green water when I need it. So when I don't need it, no problem. But if I'm relying on it to like raise fish, all of a sudden like, dang it, my water's going clear. Or Daphne or anything like that. So it's, 
I I haven't spent enough time to really dial it in, so I always have green water. I know how to do it, you know. I could set up things to actually do it, but I've never needed that much, so that uh, I've never prioritized it. Best tips for cycling a new tank? Buy some live plants with the rock wool, throw it into your tank, let it seed it. When you grow algae in plants, you're ready to start thinking about some fish. Only one of my 18 tanks in my fish room has very low pH. No wood or anything in the tank, just fish, gravel, and live plants. Any ideas? Yeah, I mean, fish in general create acidic water. So imagine I've got an Oscar in one tank, and I've got 20 Neon Tetras in another tank. Every time I feed them, the water will become slightly more acidic because the process of converting all the waste into nitrates creates a little bit of acids. If I'm feeding more food in my Oscar tank, that'll happen faster. Um, also, if you've had a tank, let's say I've had the Oscar tank set up for 10 years and the Neon Tetra tank set up for three, it's more likely this tank would be more acidic because even if I change 50% of the water every week, this 50% you fall behind in your water parameters. Even if you do it every week and you've never missed a week ever, you can fall behind still. So probably it's one of those doing a few extra water changes, looking at the amount of actual food being converted and, uh, you know, you'll get back more on track like the other tanks short of something you haven't revealed there that would cause the pH to go down. For anyone curious, Aquahuna was able to ship my order on Monday and arrived today here in Vermont. That'd be on a Wednesday. And if you're ordering from Aquahuna, we get a sweet kickback if you use the code AquariumCoop, all one word, and you save 5%. So I do make money. You do save some money. And uh, hopefully everything keeps working out. Makes it easy, so I don't have to sell fish. Do SAEs, so Siamese algae eaters, really eat string algae? I thought they didn't, but someone I trust said they do. What's their experience? Yeah, they do. Like, they'll eat black beard algae, they'll eat hair algae. In my opinion, they only do it when they're really hungry. So if you're just like, here's more blood worms, eat, 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 they're not so much eating on the hair algae. You starve that tank, though. And they will. And I find that up to about three and a half, four inches, they're pretty good at it. When they're in that breeding mode, they want a lot more protein because they're trying to breed and basically make eggs and do that. So I find that, you know, maybe the first six, eight months of life on uh, on that Siamese algae eater are really good algae eaters. Is that an Enjoy Nature daily snowboard behind you? Wait, right here? Maybe if you're like a child. It is a skateboard, though. My SAE eradicated my BBA? Yeah. I hate acronyms because it just makes my life harder. Sometimes I don't know the acronym. And then two, uh, if you're new to the hobby, you probably don't know what SAE or BBA stands for, so... My Siamese algae eater eradicated my blackbeard algae. And that happens a lot in, uh, you know, the Facebook group, the forums, that kind of stuff. And I just know that, uh, like, the, the business world is full of so many acronyms that daily I have to look it up and be like, what is this? Like, why do we even shorten that? That was a four-letter word. You got down to two letters. Like, come on. Like, it's it's annoying that uh, we've gotten to that that level, at, at least in some industries. Not as bad in aquariums, but I think, uh, yeah, I think we're better off if we use them less. I'm not, that's not an attack. I just, I need to get better at when I read the acronym to spell it out so that even new people know what I'm talking about. Mm. <laughs> good, good point. Trying to cut back on words to spam in the chat. You also are limited by characters too. So I, I definitely get where you're coming from. And I I honestly, and that's something we I, we brought up with, uh, with YouTube. I wanted it so that uh, members could actually have longer characters. 
so that you could write like a paragraph because that was my uh one of my biggest asks is like these people are paying i want them to be able to like ask these in-depth questions and their response was yeah well memberships are mostly for gamers and uh most of the gamers ask that they can't write as much so imagine you're like trying to play a game you're like trying to read something real quick they literally want you to have less characters than you have now and i'm going yeah but i'm diagnosing like you know, I, I put it in simpler terms, like imagine I'm a vet and your dog's having problems. You'd want to be able to write a paragraph, right? Not just like dog, not good. You know, you, you got to have. Uh... Yeah, so but they didn't they didn't take my suggestion to heart, or at least they haven't yet. So it's a bummer. <laughs> Acronyms try working for the government. There's probably there's probably acronyms for acronyms. Like some of those government acronyms are like 17 characters long. There's probably an acronym for that acronym. I've been bugging LRB, that's Lucas Bretz, to sell the hair algae that keeps the water clean. He now has it for sale. I don't I don't even know what that is, but all algae and plants keep water clean. I'd have to look to see what specific one they're talking about there. <laughs> I'm too lazy to read that uh, acronym Liquid Zoo, but that's funny. If you're in the podcast and only listening, you missed out. Yeah, maybe they should let the streamers set the limits. That's what they were talking about, but they were allowing it to be more restricted. So I don't even think they ever came through with that, but they were like, yeah, we're, we're actually beta testing with some creators where they can limit it more. And I was like, limit it more. How about you make it, let me make it bigger. And they're like, well, we'll put that on the developer list. And we never heard anything. It's been two years. So any advice for strong growth on Balbitis? Just getting a light algae on it. For the most part, low light, I find it thrives in and not moving in a bunch. What I like to do is like set it up like on a rock or something. And as it grows, and it might take like six months to grow this much, but as it grows and finally those roots like kind of tap down into the substrate, now it's feeding from the ground and the water column. That next six months, you might get this much out of it, right? And as long as you don't trim it and cut it and change it, you might get that much every six months. It can fill in a tank pretty good. Um, and then I just like to have a few algae eaters because I usually want more light than it wants. And what that means is I like my tanks to be fairly bright. I like it to look like the sun is shining on them. And I like that look. But in a plant that's used to being kind of dark, it grows extra algae and things. So that's why I make up the difference to algae eaters. What's the best fertilizer we sell? Easy green, what plants crave. It's an all-in-one fertilizer. This one happens to be a little small one. I got more on the shelf, but the ones on the shelf, one squirt per 10 gallons, treats 5,000 gallons for 20 bucks. This bad boy right here is for nano tanks. I think it's three drops, right? Let me make sure. Two drops, two drops per gallon. This little bottle for seven bucks will treat 1,200 gallons. I'm gonna go out of limb, say, it's amazing. It's actually our most reviewed product. Over 4,000. Wait, that, that could have been a lie. I try not to lie intentionally. Doesn't mean I don't lie. I just try not to do it intentionally. How many five-star reviews? I would say over 4,000, but that was probably a lie. That is a lie. Bold-faced lie. 3,956 five-star reviews. I would have been a liar. With another 115 at four stars, and there are 28 people out of like the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of bottles we sold, there are 28 people that think it's a one star. I bet you half of them though are just like, let's see here. My favorite is reading it because I'm trying to think of like, after I used Easy Green, my mystery snail became lethargic and died two weeks later. And that's where I go, hmm, I wonder... What are the odds that happened? Because we dose Easy Green into tanks that we keep mystery snails all the time. Like, I don't know. Says, supposed to be shrimp safe. 
with freshwater shrimp, but 24 hours after adding it to the tank, they all died. That's where I'm like, yeah, but all of my tanks have shrimp. We autodose in all of them. We have an entire warehouse. We have the whole store, and we've tested it for so many years, and then half the people in the chat will be like, yeah, it works great with my Easy Green. And it just shows, like, there's there's probably concoctions. I would I would bet money that, uh, you know, Easy Green plus Diet Coke in an aquarium is toxic or something, or, or some random other medication or product, and, like, we just can't test it all. But I know that I've... Like, when we test products, we were testing another product, and we found that at 10x the dose, it would kill shrimp, so we never launched it. This, we've gone stupid heavy on, and I've never never had a problem. Fish for thought! Cory gang! He's in the house. Long time, no speak. You know, COVID's over. You could come for a visit, which I'm going to do the straight call out. I could also come for a visit. So it's a two-way street. I could drive up there, too. We should hang out sometime. Although no spicy noodles, because I'm, I'm, I'm a wuss when it comes to spicy. So it would need to be like lukewarm noodles at best for me to, to do that video. It would have to be like butter noodles. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Can confirm Easy Green and Easy Iron are staples in my fish tank, and there's shrimp and snails in there? Yeah. I think it's just the random concoctions that can happen. Um, you know, the, Dan H says fertilizer for algae at a premium price. Man, I was expecting with this product based on all of the glowing five star reviews. However, after three weeks of using it as directed on the bottle, my 65 gallon tank is green. The algae bloom is intense. I didn't see any extraordinary growth in my plants. This product seems to be safe for my guppies. Not worth it, IMO. Well, hopefully he reached out to us and we gave him a refund. Because we will, if you're not happy with Easy Green, we'll give you your money back. We'll let you keep it. You know, maybe you hate the way tacos, cookies, donuts, and, and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups taste. That doesn't mean those are bad products. just means it's not for you, I guess. Well, let's see. I broke my collarbone recently, so hopefully I will drive down there after it heals. Man. Luckily, I haven't had that. That sounds not fun. Also, with like a seatbelt, definitely doesn't sound fun. Any news on bringing freshwater shrimp books for diagnosing illness? I have no news. I didn't know I was supposed to be working on that, but also means I have not. Is there a bulk order discount? If you buy 20 bottles of Easy Green, maybe if you buy it at the retail store, I could work that out. But most of the price of Easy Green is a stupid shipping. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's there's no no discounts there. You might be able to work out something with a with a other retail partner store because they're buying in massive quantities, maybe. Although I'm not even really encouraging that because then technically they're breaking the map pricing and people can get all bent out of shape. But um, yeah, we our, our, our big thing is we try to keep the prices as low as we can. If you've been watching Easy Green for any amount of time, it actually used to treat 2,500 gallons for 20 bucks. Wait, no, that's a lie. For 15 bucks. Then it went to 20 bucks, but treats... 5,000 gallon. Better for the environment. Shipping went up a stupid amount. That sucked. But we treat more now. So it's, you know, the landscape's always changing on us. And when we launched Easy Green, it cost me $6.20 to ship it. Now it's averaging 12. Nah, I think it's 11.40 actually. What should I have for lunch, Corey? This is my new favorite game. This is definitely my new favorite game. What should I have for lunch? Kyle Hernandez, if you're in America, in the USA, what would I recommend for lunch? I would eat... What, what would I do right now? What was I going to do? Hmm. If you have a Cafe Rio local, definitely would eat Cafe Rio. If that's off the table, I would then... Sit down in a Mexican restaurant. 
So many things I'm like, like the sourdough Jack from Jack in the Box. After building with Dean for 12 hours and not eating for the last six, I was hungry. So I went to a Jack in the Box and I was like, do I, do I go expensive and get a jump or get a sourdough Jack? Or do I go the normal Corey cheap route and get uh, the chicken sandwich for two fifty? Well, when I saw the price of just a sourdough jack being seven, like sixty five, I went with the chicken sandwich. My brain, my old man brain, because I'm turning forty on Friday. My old brain, my old man brain, cannot come to terms with back in my day. You would have got the whole combo for $6. Now you can't even get the sandwich for $6. So I'm forced to, it, it, yeah. And I was, while I was ordering, I was looking at the rest of the value menu. And I was like, wait, a, a junior bacon cheeseburger is $4? I, I need to stop coming here. Like, I just need to sit down and eat real food. It obviously was late. So I couldn't because there's nowhere open, but, you know. I'll take an entire container of Easy Green, please. I think, what is it like? We, our normal orders are between sixty and 70,000. I don't know how many pallets that is, though. But there's also root tabs and Easy Iron and some other stuff there, too. So I always cringe when I was like, whoa, what would we buy? Oh, Easy Green. Okay, it's the number one selling product. Okay. I really invite you for the next time wife and I are planning our monthly meal planning. That's that's going to be my new service. I'm going to plan. You will enjoy the food. It won't be healthy, but you'll enjoy it. Did I ever work at a Walmart years ago in Tennessee? Nope. I did not. That's right. I'm supposed to retire on Friday, but... I decided I'm just going to try to not die of stress instead. That was after, after a year of working with a business coach, turns out I just want less stress and not so much not to work. Like I love working on products and making products better. I hate stress, <laughs> which I think most people do. So maybe we should send a, a Corey, a tin of chocolate chip cookies for his birthday. I will say not that I want to pan it. Okay. I do want to panhandle for it. I absolutely love getting anything in the mail to the store. Someone, I can't remember his name, I think his name is John. We still have the letter, and I, I was busy, but he sent us some prototypes of some rad uh, floating fry containers that were 3D printed and a bag of Reese's. That basically kept Dean and I going for two different days over two weeks in the warehouse expansion with those Reese's. But uh, I also have, like, we got a, uh, someone made us a quilt that I cherish, that I love to use. So I'll be sitting there, laptop working, got my goldfish quilt. Um, what else have we gotten over the years that, there's been art, there's been candy. I like edible stuff because it just goes wherever, like, it either goes where I'm working. So either in the fish room or something like that. And there's like, oh, someone grab that Reese's or something. And then, uh. Yeah, there's, I don't know. It's just it's always cool to get stuff. That's I guess that's what I could say. Which I think everyone likes that though. Like, oh sweet, what? The, oh, wow, look at this thing. I think I'm powered by stress. It's probably not healthy. I I think uh, yeah. I I can safely. Well, I guess that's not true. My my labs come back that I'm healthy, but this amount of gray and just. Uh, yeah, some days there's just so much stress that there's like never ending dread. That can't be good. <laughs> so, yeah, reducing stress threats, fueling your body better. Anything from Jack in the Box is going to make it worse. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. A business genius? I don't know. I'm definitely, definitely okay at business. And there's some luck in there. And I got a lot of good people supporting me, which makes it easier. Living the dream? Pretty close to it. Making my living off of fish is a pretty pretty close to the dream, I would say, from what I had. 
the nice gentleman that used to send us a box of huge or a huge box of candy and gummies. That's right. I still see him. He'll show up at uh, at aquatic or not aquatic experience, uh, aqua shell and stuff. Doesn't work at the candy factory anymore though. But that was fun times. Like literally massive things of candy would show up for all the employees and everything like a few times a year because he he like managed the plant that made the candy. So it probably cost him about a dollar seventy two. Way more to ship it, I'm sure, than the actual uh than the actual candy, but you know, pretty sweet. Hmm. Any ideas on how to get a water, wait, how to get the waterfall noise in a 40 gallon tough stuff dock tank pond? I have a Coop's sponge filters in there currently. So you want to add that sound. What I would do personally, I would get probably like the co-op power head or just any power head if you got one laying around and a piece of tubing. And then I would get like a corner and build up a couple of rocks, get the tubing on the rocks, put a couple more rocks so you don't see the tubing, and that water just falling back down off the, the, the rocks would create a babbling brook, and you'd hear it. That's what I would do. Plus, you'll get the benefit, which you don't know of yet, is those wet rocks will grow a little bit of algae, but they'll stay wet, and you'll get bees and bugs getting a drink there where they can't really get it from the water. they got to have somewhere to land and kind of drink. And they don't really do that from the, the top of a pond. They want to do it from a lily pad or a rock or a piece of wood, anything floating. So you'll, you'll actually add an extra layer of nature that way. I love your store partnerships. I still order my plants online, but now I can get my supplies from Twin City Guppies. I always end up buying additional items while I'm there. That's living the dream right there. Right there. Oh, it's it's actually after six. Huh. We did it. Have I tried Taco Bell's new burritos? No. Last time I bought a burrito was like four months ago. And it was like $3 and 90% tortilla. And I shook my head after two bites and I threw it away. Which, if you know me, that doesn't happen. Because I've already spent the money. But I was so angry at how crappy it was. And it was all tortilla. Versus, like, growing up where the quality was better. And you actually, like, oh, look at this. It's an actual burrito. It's 89 cents. So, I yeah. I end up swearing off more and more and more places that I used to like. Because I'm like, it's just, the value proposition's not there. So... I haven't tried it. I hope, I hope it, it's amazing and I fall in love with it because that's it's always good to find new food. Have ever been into other types of animals like reptiles or birds? Mm. I bred, we bred crested geckos once. I do have some turtles with eggs right now, but I haven't been heavy into the the reptiles. Never owned a bird, but we are geeking out a lot with the, the burbs we got out on our deck from. We put out a bird feeder and a bird bath. So pretty much bird experts at this point. You know, we've been watching them for a solid three weeks. Probably going to have to open up an online store about birds and a YouTube channel. Taco Bell's nasty. I, I, I don't disagree Although I would I would say 20 years ago Taco Bell was decent and like 30 years ago Taco Bell was straight up good. But so many things were. Birds aren't real? That's true. Does someone make a site visit to every partner store? Definitely not. We considered that and then we were like that that just costs way too much money and we're not doing that. So we do as much research as we can online, talk to the people, try to get a sense for it. But uh, no, it's our goal to go and visit them all and kind of support them and do stuff like that. But uh, no, it wasn't in our game plan. We didn't really have a game plan. It was kind of like, let's try and help a store or two. And then, uh-oh, more stores want in. Okay, let's make this a thing, I guess. 
And then we kind of got overwhelmed, so we stopped letting people in, and now we're starting to let people trickle back in. So if if you're wanting your local store to get involved, you can tell them, hey, apply. And the biggest thing we actually see is that stores will apply, and they'll get accepted, and then they'll wait like three months to place an order. So that's actually, and we have to like hound them. Not that we're hounding them, but it's like, hey, it's been a month. Like, are you going to order? And then, hey, it's been two months. Like, if you don't order soon, we're gonna we're gonna sell to another store in your city, like close to you, because you're not ordering. And then eventually, they'll usually get on and actually order. So, uh, but yeah, if you want your store to do it, tell you know, take them to the website, be like, hey, you apply here. We'll start, you know, we'll start saying the terms and you know, investigating their store and all those things and and all that, and uh, it works out most of the time. You know, we're, we're fairly, we're fairly accommodating. Like I like small business in mom and pop type stores. And so I want to give them the benefit of the doubt they're doing a good job. So if they have good reviews and their store looks pretty good, let's give them a chance. Cause we can always take it away, right? We can always go, Hey, you're being bad to our customers. We won't sell to you anymore. And We'll have found out because a customer told us, and we'll make it right with the customer and go, whoop, our bad. But I don't want it to, you know, just be some elite club that nobody can get into. That doesn't make sense either. So, you know, my main goal is to help the mom and pop stores just like I am. And, uh, yeah, so as long as they're trying to do a good job, let's give them a chance. You know, sometimes there's there's stores where you're like, yeah, they're really not getting good reviews or they don't care or whatever, and they don't get in. But for the most part, you know, it's we look at them, then, well, maybe we do some phone calls. It's almost like hiring somebody. You know, you like to look at the resume, like, how's the reviews look and this kind of stuff. And like, well, let's have a call with them. Are they, are they you know, saying things we like? Like, they really, do they seem like they care? Do they seem like they know fish? It's pretty good. What's the exclusive range for the partner stores? We don't have one anymore. We we were thinking originally like X amount of miles, but as we got into more stores, that didn't make sense. Like if you're in San Francisco or New York, the populations are so dense. Or even like Seattle. You could have three or four stores in Seattle, and Seattleites will look at you like, there's no way I would drive over there. Like that would take 11 minutes. And so depending, you know, if it's a small town, maybe there's only room for one, right? But if it's a town where the population is insane and like one side or the other side of Seattle at the wrong time of day is a 10 hour trip, you know, that makes more sense. We're, we're basically just trying, we don't want to make it so that they got to really compete or anything. And we don't want to be just everywhere, but we want to work with people that basically if, if uh, they seem to be good people and they want to do right by Aquarists, we are, we want to work with them. That's, it's kind of simple as that. We'll make money, you make money and you treat the customer right. As long as we keep doing that, that's great. You know, we don't want to ever get it where it's like, Oh no, this person you know, we also don't want, you know, we want to limit it to hopefully that, oh, you bought this product here and now you're trying to return it to a different store and they're not happy about it. We're trying to limit all that for the most part. Found a great store on a recent business trip that sold the coop. Yeah, I mean, that's, we, we there's so many of the stores. If you're driving around, they are great, great stores. You know, some of them are brand new too. Like we, we literally have people that are brand new. They've been open. Like since I went to one where it was the grand opening, but we interviewed them. We thought like, well, you know what? These are good people. These seem like good people and we shouldn't exclude them just because they don't have a track record yet. You know, so you gotta get, you gotta get the feeling about it. You gotta just, you know, sometimes you gotta go with the gut and Zendo's like, you know what? Let's go for it. And I said, Hey, we can, we can always stop working with them if they're not doing a good thing. So it was fun. You can put any sand in an aquarium? Almost. The only sand that hasn't worked for me is pool filter sand when it had bits of plastic in it. It all floated. But 
For the most part, yes. Are there any partner stores in Phoenix, Arizona? We have a local store finder on the website. I'm going to link it here, and then I'm going to look for you. So everybody could look to see if they have one local to them. But in Arizona, huh? Let's see. And you're looking for where? Was it Phoenix? Where'd that go? Yeah, Phoenix, Arizona. We have one. It looks to be uh, the Cichlid Shack, which, by the way, I follow as many of the stores as I can. So I know that I saw, like yesterday, a Cichlid Shack is closing their retail, I believe, uh, from Monday to Friday for like the next couple of weeks. So they can catch up. They, they ship fish online, and they're open on the weekends. So know that. Uh, but then... Normally, they're open Tuesday to Saturday, they say here. So, yeah, Phoenix, Arizona, this, or I guess it's Temp, Tempe, Tempe? I think it's Tempe. Tempe, Arizona. And then there's another store in Arizona, which is uh, in Tucson, Abstract Aquariums. So, but over time, I expect there'll be more and more and more. I, don't even, I think we're at 80 something as the count right now of stores. So, I still think it's crazy that we have none in Oregon because there's a decent amount of fish stores in there. Just haven't, haven't infiltrated it yet. All right. Dogs are barking. I should probably go look at my broken lawnmower while I still have daylight to figure out what I'm going to do there. It's also 16 minutes past the hour. And I can hear the blower. So I will see you guys. Well, I might not see you. I might be out of... T I'm going to be out of town i think so i may or may not probably not see you next week uh for that wednesday stream maybe though i might be able to do it for my phone we'll see time differences and all that crazy stuff but look out for other stuff look out for an announcement with the lights coming back into stock that should happen this week i hope with unless they're restricted forever and uh yeah see grandma on sunday and i'll see you guys at the latest couple weeks. Otherwise, video on Friday. We'll see you later. Thanks for all the free memberships that people donated. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for liking, subscribing, hanging out, buying our stuff, supporting what we do, supporting your local stores. Don't forget, compliment somebody this week in their hobby and next week in case I don't go live. So you got it two weeks in a row. Report back, and we'll see you on a Wednesday. Later.